Our scripture reading this afternoon is Acts. The book of Acts will be reading chapter 1, the whole chapter. Acts chapter 1 and beginning in verse 1. And this is God's true and eternal and infallible word. The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, Wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, beheld, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Then returned they into Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew. Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes, and Judas the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women, and Mary the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, The number of names together were about a hundred and twenty. Men and brethren, the scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch as that field is called in their proper tongue, Aseldama, that is to say, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. Wherefore, of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John and unto the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And they appointed two. Joseph, called Barsabas, who was also sur um, surnamed Justice, 
and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias." I invite you to open again God's Word to the book of Acts chapter 1. And most of us know, I'm sure it's, you are aware, that this book was written by Luke. And we have just finished the Gospel according to Luke. And there are many, many things that led me to consider um, coming now to the book of Acts. Um, to be one of the books that we'll be exposing um, chapter by chapter. We have already covered in, in our recent past around six chapters, the very beginning of Luke. We have been going to it for different occasions, so we'll be able to summarize to a great degree some of our past sermons, even concerning the installation of elders and deacons. And so the first chapters we have covered not too long ago. Um, we have ended Luke, um, and we now can begin what really is considered the second volume that follows Luke. You, you find the continuation even as you see that Acts is written by Luke, and he also dedicates it to Theophilus. He says, the former treaties, which he refers this to Luke, have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. And if you'll remember in chapter 1 of Luke, as he indicates that he's starting this book, that he in verse 2 of chapter 1, he says, Even as they delivered them unto us, the, the things about the life of Christ were given to us. He's speaking of the apostles having taught Luke, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. Verse 3 of Luke 1, It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. So he dedicates and writes the Gospel of Luke to Theophilus, and then he continues the life and the ministry of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he also dedicates it to Theophilus. Some, some people believe something happened to Theophilus that's very clear that Theophilus is now a true believer. He begins by calling him most excellent Theophilus. There, there was a measure of, of acknowledging that this man had a high position and a respect for who he was. And yet, having read the gospel according to Luke, the Lord having worked in his life, he's now a true disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And possibly this is what makes Luke have the freedom to say, O oh, Theophilus, as speaking to a brother now and not someone who's in, in, in high society or high standing, but now a brother. Well, Theophilus means a lover of God. Some people actually think this is a code name to say that it's actually a letter for everyone and everyone who loves God is one who can read these passages and be blessed by, by what you read. But very likely, most likely, it was a specific person who received these two volumes. And so they are meant to go together. And also, of course, as we read through Acts, it really is a, a manual, manual for the church. It has been considered a manual for evangelism, a manual for church planting, for missions. Um, it is a book that manifests and, and shows forth the power of God on earth. It is considered to be the acts, not only of the apostles, but the acts of the Holy Spirit in the church. The acts of the Lord Jesus from heaven through the Spirit in the lives of men and women who trust and serve Him 
here on earth. You, we read through Acts and we get the idea that Jesus is, is right there with them. And, and we're not hearing his name anymore as someone walking with them. But the things that are happening, it's, it almost gives a sense that the gospel of Luke is continuing. And because that is the sense. Jesus, Jesus is with us still through the presence of the Holy Spirit. And the works that are being done are, are greater in some dimensions, like Jesus said that the apostles would do. Because we begin to hear the conversions of thousands and how God's word goes and permeates the whole known world. So it's the narrative of the beginnings of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in the fullness. Jesus, God, the Father, always had His people. And in a sense, you could say that is His church. The word church means an assembly of people. So there's always been the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. But you understand what it means that now there's been a fullness of time. that Before, there were prophecies that had to still be fulfilled. And, and now here we are at the beginning. Um, in this chapter 1, there's really just one more thing that has to be fulfilled, which is Pentecost and the coming of the Holy Spirit. But we find Christ saying, just stay here, just a few days hence, and you will receive these promises. The book of Acts demonstrates this as it goes. Um, it starts in Jerusalem and it ends in Rome. And it begins with the band of believers, as we read, 11 apostles. There's even one missing, but then there are women and men adding to around 120 people. But before we read it, we hear that there are 5,000 now. By the time of the end of Acts, there will be believers in Israel, in Syria, in Asia Minor, in Greece, in Macedonia, in Italy, and even in Ethiopia, and the surrounding areas, and even islands reached with the gospel. And with boldness, Paul could declare this. If we read in Romans 15.20, we, we read this. Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. So he kept finding places where the gospel had not reached. He says, for which cause also I have been much hindered from coming to you. But now, having no more place in these parts, and having a great desire these many years to come unto you, Whensoever I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you. So the reason Paul thought he could go to Rome is because really everywhere behind Rome towards Jerusalem had in many ways been reached already with the gospel. So, so Acts is in many ways the fulfillment of that parable that Jesus told of the mustard seed. Where it begins so tiny, it can hardly be seen. Think in terms global and in terms... Um, 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 general and in terms political, this little band of men and women that we find, 120, is like a mustard seed. But by the time the book of Acts ends, it is a full-grown tree and it gives shade to all the creatures below and there are birds that find um, shelter inside that tree. It is a blessing to the Holy Roman Empire, to the Roman Empire that later is called holy because so many Christians um, are in it. By 204, we find Tertullius, Tertullian writing this, one of the ancient church fathers. He says, We are but of yesterday, yet have we filled all places among you. Cities, Islands, citadels, boroughs, assemblies, your very camp, your tribes of common people, the palace, the senate, the judicatories, we only leave to you your temples. For what war are not we fit and ready, though we were fewer in number, who so willingly are put to death? And so now Christianity is throughout the whole known world. And it began with Acts. See, Acts is the beginning of all this history. So let us begin by looking at the promise of the Father. We'll look at the seasons of the Father and then the provision of the Father. So the book of Acts starts with these three realities. The first chapter really contains these, these three dimensions. 
the, the promise of the power, the reality that the seasons are of the Father and not ours, and the provisions of the Father. God will provide. We'll look at three things that God provides. And with these three things, the church grows in this direction that we've been talking about in our introduction. See, the world doesn't understand this. The world thinks and for things to grow, there has to be money. There has to be predictions. There has to be a lot of planning. There has to be a lot of, 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 of methods. There has to be a lot of committees. There's really just three things that God gives. And with these three things, it goes. And it fills, as we heard Tertullian say, everywhere except for the temples. Because no Christians had any desire to work serving the pagan gods. But as those temples were sold to other enterprises, I'm sure believers then became the ones who took care of things in, in those structures. They permeated everywhere. Let's look at the promise of the Father. And, and we find it right at the very beginning. Jesus says, wait for the promise of the Father, which ye have heard of me. And what is this promise? In verse 5 we see that they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they, when they ask about restoring the kingdom to Israel, and, and, and we'll look at what Jesus says about the times and the seasons, but he repeats there in verse 8, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses. And so the promise that Jesus is giving is primarily this of the Holy Spirit, but this power of the Holy Spirit will be enacted, and when we can't miss this, this is what we see in the rest of the book. It will be enacted through the Word. Through the Word of God. Look at verse 4 again. Wait for the promise of the Father, which ye have heard of me. That little word heard is, is very powerful because it's Jesus saying the words that we heard of Him. This, this is what the Bible is. It's what we have heard from God. This is the Word of God. And it has power. And the Holy Spirit has power. And the Holy Spirit uses the Word in a powerful way to save souls. And to guide us and to direct us. And, and one thing that's very important. I've heard it put this way. Yes, the Word is powerful, but without the Spirit, it is dead. There are people who have said that. Well-meaning people, Christian people. But we need to understand it the right way. This is the Word of God. It is never dead. I, I read this in a commentary this week. That as much as the Word of God is powerful, it is dead without the Spirit. See, I understand what they're trying to say, but we need to get this right from the very beginning. No, the Word of God is alive. We are the dead ones to it without the power of the Spirit. See, we need to understand this because it's not like this does not become the Word of God. It is the Word of God. And while somebody responds to it with lack of faith, it is not that it's dead to him. He is dead to it. And it's important to have this understanding so that we see where the problem lies. Uh, the problem does not lie on the side of the Word. Never. It is the Word. It, it is even the, Christ Himself as the Word. This is the will of the Father. This is who Jesus wanted us to know. It, it has been inspired by the Holy Spirit. It is living. It is powerful. And it gives life. It gives understanding. It gives insight. The problem is in our hearts that is dead to it. And we need the Holy Spirit to enliven us, to illuminate us. And when we read the scripture, yes, it will be a living book to us at that point. And so even if they write it that way, I don't, I don't like it put that way because it's really sounding as if there is a problem with the word until God comes and fix it and puts the spirit. No, we need to understand this is a living word. It is powerful. We are the ones dead to it without the Spirit. And so these are the two things that God promises from the very beginning. Now, the, the reason I want to put in 
the reality of the word in, in this first point also is to show all of what happens in Acts. 30% of this book is preaching and teaching. It's a book that is historical. It is detailing the beginnings of the church. There's a lot of interaction that really puts it in the category of, of historical narrative. And yet one third of it is the preaching of the gospel. It is the teaching, explaining and setting forth the character of God and how to be saved and declaring um, what the gospel is and how we need it and how we do not deserve it. And like we just read Paul um, writing to the Romans, well, he's the one in Acts trying to find where to go because he's wanting to make people hear the word of Christ. It is uh, the, 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 the whole historical narrative is of the word going forth to all these lands. And here we find Peter, even as we'll see in our third point, when he's there trying to find out, they're trying to find out who should be the one to take place of Judas. And you see how they are guided by the word. In verse 20 of chapter 1, he says, For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let this habitation, his habitation, be desolate, and let no man dwell therein. And this psalm, very important, this is Psalm 109, verse 8, and his bishopric, or his position, his office, let another take. You see what Peter's doing? He's, he's thinking, we have a problem. We, we had 12, we only have one. And there are psalms that says that are related to Judas, who was the betrayer, he identifies Psalm 69, 25. That's the first two phrases of verse 20. And the last phrase of verse 20 is Psalm 109, verse 8. Psalm 69, 25. Psalm 109, verse 8. See what Peter's doing. He's, it's the word guiding Peter as to what to do. This is what I mean by the power of the word. This is, there have been people to say, this was Peter being Peter. And he's trying to talk and he's making this decision. Some people argue and they say, we never hear of Matthias again. It must have been wrong. This is not how we interpret Scripture. Uh, many of the commentaries I read simply say this. There's not a word that indicates that Peter did something wrong. Jesus has just been with them and indicated the things that they're supposed to do. Peter is going to Scripture he is using prophecy. There was a prophecy that said, let another take his bishopric. And so Matthias is chosen. And even though people say, well, wasn't Paul the apostle who took this place? There's a problem when we say this. Because for, to say that Paul was to be one of these 12 very apostles indicates that there was a difference in how to choose the apostle. Peter was making clear how to be an apostle. You had to be with Jesus from his very beginning to the very end. They saw Jesus die and they saw Jesus resurrect. Yes, the word apostle starts being used a little looser. Even Barnabas is considered in some places an apostle. But he's not one of the twelve. And so you see the word guiding Peter and they choose Matthias and the Holy Spirit. It's just astonishing how it is. Because the Holy Spirit is, of course, the source of the power. He is God. He is divine. Yet he inspired the authors who wrote what is here. And when you read the Bible, you are reading what God wants you to know. That's why you can't say that it is dead. It, 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 these are the words of God. They are life. And the Holy Spirit is the one who comes in your heart and who enlivens you, who gives eyes to see. A heart that perhaps was hard to Scripture now becomes soft to it. An understanding that was darkened by unbelief is now made light by faith. And it's all the Spirit doing this in your heart. I was with my students in, in, in our Sunday school and we're going through the Canons of Dort and we were seeing exactly the article that speaks of God doing this to the heart. The very next few words says how this goes to the will. When the heart is hard, the will says no. But then when the heart is softened, the will says yes. 
So you may offer the Bible to someone and their heart is hard. and They'll say, I don't want that book. You say, well, it's a gift anyway. And they put it on their shelf. And when the Lord softens that heart, they might very well pick it up and read it. Because, see, the softening of the heart makes the will more open. And then as they read the scripture, it softens the heart more and the will becomes more pliable still. And it gets to the point where they say, I believe. This is very likely and obviously is what happened. We don't know exactly when, where the excellent Theophilus became the O Theophilus. Theophilus, like, like any one of us, did not come into this life fully believing the gospel. He was not born a lover of God. But as he heard God's word, he was saved by the power of the word, by the working of the Holy Spirit. So this is the promise that the Father gives and, and just since we're speaking of this very promise, I want to read again question 53. What dost thou believe concerning the Holy Ghost? First, that he is true and co-eternal God with the Father and the Son. This is why he has the power to soften, to open, to illuminate hearts. Secondly, that he has also given me to make me by a true faith partaker of Christ and all his benefits, that he may comfort me and abide with me forever. And these are three blessings of the Spirit. He makes us partake of Christ and all His benefits. He comforts us. He is the comforter. And also He abides with us forever. This is what gives us the earnest of the Spirit where we have the certainty that we will be in heaven because we have the Spirit already in earth. This is how God works in the life of His own and of His children. But let us go to our second point where we speak of the seasons of the Father. I bring this point because as, as they um, see that it is time perhaps to ask our last few questions, it says in verse 6, when they therefore were come together, they asked him saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time, this is verse 6 of chapter 1 of Acts, restore again the kingdom of Israel? And Jesus says, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. So the seasons of the Father. And we need to understand that there are things that do not belong to us. They belong only to the Father. The seasons and the times. See, what the apostles were doing, they were going back to their same mistake again as they did so very often. Calvin says there are as many errors in this question as there are words. We've gone through Luke. Remember how many times that is what they were wondering about. Who will sit on your right and on your left? And the end times, when are these things happening? The kingdom, when will it come? And Jesus was always saying, stop thinking of time. Stop thinking of prediction. Stop thinking of future. Stop thinking of this earth and this world and politically and, and with earthly power. It is all spiritual. The kingdom is already in you, Jesus would say. And you have to be certain if you're in it, not when it will come, but are you saved now? Remember, Jesus always driving them to that which mattered. And this is what Jesus is doing again. The, the times and seasons belong to the Father. It's not a matter of when these things will come. Don't worry about the future. And, and notice what they were wanting. This is how humans are, right? We, we know... That if I knew what's going to happen, it will give me power today. Well, of course, if you knew what will be high on the stock market, you know what you would purchase today. You know if a certain house will be valued in a certain year, you would, you would maybe invest in it. If you knew that this job would be the ideal job and everything will work just right, well, you'll choose just this job over another. You know, predictions give power. They wanted power. They were thinking materially. They're thinking of the kingdom. They're thinking strategically. They're, they're still thinking in terms of, of, of Rome leaving Israel and Israel having an independence. 
and having again, as it were, King David on the throne. And Jesus tells him, stop that. It has nothing to do. The kingdom of God has nothing to do with with physical power. This is something we all need, beloved. And even when we think of our own nation, and and we would like to see our nation with with a greatness about it and a blessing about it, we should be wanting our nation to be godly, to be holy. Even if we end up being in a nation that things are not the best politically, but will the church be godly and holy there? That's the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God has nothing to do with the structures of the world. It has to do with the structures of heaven here in the world. And so Jesus said, you'll receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. See, he's pointing them to heaven while they're thinking of earth. Don't think of this this earth. We, we, We should pray for this world. We we pray for the countries. We pray that there is peace. Jesus never is saying that we should have nothing to do with the affairs of this world in that way. We just need to understand that's that's not what Christianity is. That's not what being a believer means. What being a believer means that we serve our God in heaven through the power of the Spirit And we have everything in this book that should guide our life and our practice. And we seek to win the whole world for Christ. Because we are sent forth as witnesses. See, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, notice how one of the mistakes they were doing is how little they were thinking. When they think of the kingdom and restoring it from Rome, that we would be independent, they're thinking that in God's mind, they're going to continue being little Israel, just now good and better and independent. And Christ wants them to be in the uttermost parts of the earth see what Jesus is saying you're not that head of that statue that Nebuchadnezzar saw you're not even the parts of the chest and the arms and you're not even the thigh and you're not even the legs and we are actually that rock that comes which is the Lord Jesus that destroys that whole kingdom and that rock grows and grows and grows and never anything destroys that kingdom So that this is, in truth, happening this very moment. There are believers throughout the whole face of the earth. And every true believer is part of the kingdom of God. Jesus is our king. We do not know these brothers or sisters, but we are in allegiance with them. And if you've traveled, the moment you meet them, immediately there is a kinship. There is a sense of you are my brother in Christ. We've never known each other. We've never seen each other. We don't even know if we agree in every dictates of God's word together. But if you love Christ, you are my brother. Or you are my sister. And you may have met people that way. Even, even in America, you travel to a little town. It is, it is the Lord's Day. You're in vacation. You go to a church, and all of a sudden you meet brothers and sisters you never knew you had. But that fellowship and that unity is there in the bonds of peace. That's the kingdom. It is spiritual. So leave the seasons and leave the times to the Lord And trust in Him that He would give this power. He's telling them, and we live in days where this power has come already. And thirdly, I rush to our third point, the provision of the Father. We will speak again of this power. There are three things that God provides at the very beginning, at this very foundation of the planting of the church in in its fullness. The church, I think it's important to know, has always existed. Adam and Eve were part of the church of Christ because they were assembled in the name of God. Yet, you understand, there was a lot to be revealed still. The little fledgling church is now 120 strong. We can put even here in application. A lot of people say, who cares about membership? Can't we just float from church to church? And there are people with this mindset nowadays You find right here where they 
They speak of the name of them together. We're about 120. Now there's already this concept of let's count the sheep of the flock of the Lord Jesus Christ. And certainly all those 120, they were being zealous to make sure they were going well. That is the very foundation and God provides three blessings, three provisions. The first one is the spirit. This is the very, the, the, the very central focus of this promise. He says it right at the very beginning that you'll be baptized with the Holy Ghost. He says you'll receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Chapter 2 will be all about this, the fulfillment of this very power. The Holy Ghost will come. And the blessing of having the Holy Spirit, I'll remind you, is, is, it is eternal. Because when you receive the Holy Spirit, you receive God. He is not an angel of God. He is not a prophet like Moses. It is not like having your private Elijah. It is having God. He is true and co-eternal God with the Father and the Son. Our human minds cannot even grasp this. He does not come alongside us if you are a believer. He is in you. He dwells. The word dwell is tabernacle. You are the tent. The Holy Spirit is dwelling. The believer and I remember one pastor putting it this way. He's not coming for a visit like you might come to a friend. You sit down, you have tea, and you leave. You're not dwelling that home. But the Holy Spirit doesn't come that way. He comes to dwell. It is not a few hours and He's gone. He enters and stays. That's promise number one. Promise number two that we have already spoken of. Well, the provision are on this promise as we saw it in our first point. The, the provision number two is the word, and we spoke about it. In our, in our third point, I really want to speak more and in conclusion of the provision number three. Um, a lot of people don't put much weight on this, and yet it is a provision. It is a provision that has no power, and yet it is a means. It is a provision that yes, in and of itself is dead. And yet with the Word and the Spirit, it is living and useful. It is a provision that due to its own weaknesses, due to its own nature, the world even sends it to die. That's how the world sees this provision. Many have burnt these alive. They have said, this person is of no use on this earth. Burn him. Feed him to the animals, Nero said to many of these provisions. Illuminate the gardens of my palace, Nero said, with these God-given provisions. You, you know what I mean. This is the provisions of the servants of God. And this is where the parallel is. God promised the power that is that is. Um, foundational, which is the Holy Spirit. And then he promised the message. And the power, resist, resist, uh, the power resides in the message as the Holy Spirit illuminates people to receive this message. But then God gave, us, gave the church a third provision. Messengers. Servants. Who will... Hear the message and believe it. Carry it in their life and walk and heart. And tell the whole world who Jesus is. Beloved, notice this, this is exactly what's in our text. Look at verse 8. But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And, and what? And ye shall be witnesses. See, God is giving this blessing to the church that we're not, we're not just people saved in this little huddle of people. We are witnesses unto Christ. Look what he says, unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to uttermost parts of the earth. And beloved, the, the fact that we're here in America 
many oceans away from little Israel, is showing the fulfillment of this very thing. Forty years after this was preached, maybe there was a Christian in Cyprus reading this and thinking, wow, we're already, in a sense, the, the uttermost parts of the earth, but one little ship and, and, and we're there in Israel. Then there were believers in, in Greece, and then there were believers in Italy, and then in Spain, and then in China, and there are believers here in New Jersey, in Kenilon. And we're not just believers. If you're a true Christian, you're supposed to be a witness. See, God's gift to the church is not just members, but servants. And beloved, this is where I believe the book of Acts is so practical to your life and mine. It is teaching who you are if you're a Christian. If you're not a Christian, it's teaching you who you should be. Because the whole world is called to believe in this Christ. You, if you're in Jerusalem, Judea, and in Samaria, and into the uttermost parts of the earth, there's nowhere in this universe for whom the gospel is not for. So if you're here and you don't know Christ, you must. And if you're here and you know Christ, you must serve Him. Not just be a number in a church, but be a servant and a martyr. When I say the word martyr, I'm just transliterating the word witness in Greek. It's the word martyr. And you notice what happened. I know I mentioned this not too long ago, but I want to bring this. It's very important. And we say witness, witness, witness. And, and, and that, that's, that's a word that shows what you're supposed to be. You, you should testify. You should tell others. You, you should be a testimony. You should be someone who bears a message and you live that message and people ask you about it and you say, yes, I know it's true. It's in God's Word. Jesus died for sinners. But imagine if in our area, witnesses to Christ started dying for that witness. Oh, they put that witness in jail. They put that witness behind bars. They executed that witness before too long. The word witness would sound like someone who dies for their witness. That's exactly what happened with the word martyr. Jesus is telling them in, in the Greek, he's saying that the Holy Ghost will come upon you and ye shall be martyrs. And in their minds, they understood witnesses. But by the year of Tertullian, Martyrs meant people who gave their lifeblood for the sake of Christ because so many witnesses died. It was like synonymous. It is now. The word martyr doesn't just mean witness, but it means a witness who dies for the sake of Christ. And beloved, this is the gift. This is the provision that God is giving. They, they looked around us and they saw there's a problem here that needs to be fixed. And God's Word gives a solution. One has to be chosen. There were 12 of us. We miss one. We were all witnesses from the days of Jesus' baptism. We followed Him. We went along with Him. Who among us was here from that very beginning? And they had these two names. We, we don't know if there were maybe more who were there with John the Baptist and throughout all the ministry of Jesus. But obviously it seems that Joseph and Matthias were the ones who were mostly there. And beloved, here a big application for you. You know, we're, we're thinking of somebody for a ministry and we will not choose someone who's hardly ever in church. Who hardly ever hears sermons. Who hardly ever comes to prayer meeting. And, but this is a very important position. We need someone who is faithful. And this is what they did. They started looking around and said, well, you just came with us the second year of Jesus. You came with, it was the first year, but you weren't there on the day he was baptized. It would be so good to have someone who saw him even go through the waters with John the Baptist. Did you see that dove that, that when, when there was a Holy Spirit that came like in the dove? You know, they probably had conversations like this and, and they found two who were there with Jesus, eyewitnesses of the whole thing. And they prayed, and they, they, they seemed one more indication that, of course, they're asking the Lord to help them. They, they prayed, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two hast, thou hast chosen. 
when it says that the lot fell for Matthias, it indicates that they had two objects. It's, it's hard for us to understand exactly how these lots were. Many understand that most likely it was little stones. Sometimes they would put yes and no when they would ask questions like this. Lord, should we do this or not? And if it fell yes or no, they would understand. That's possibly how the Urim and Thummim were. Here, very likely, they wrote names in two little stones or objects, put them inside something, and they took one, and it was Matthias. And they took that to be the one God chose. He became the twelfth apostle. This is God providing for his church. He provided a witness who, by what we read in ancient um, tradition, he became a martyr, as we understand the term martyr today. Just a few questions as we close in application. Have you trusted the message of the messengers that God has provided of the gospel? Could you, could you say with all honesty, that you have trusted this message. You have embraced the message of Christ. Christ is your Savior. You have trusted Him. Are you a faithful witness? Could you say that are you a faithful martyr? Think of martyr in the way it meant in the old days, and that means witness. And would you re be ready to be a witness that would one day turn into a martyr? I believe every Christian should meditate to consider this. If, if you're too scared to follow Jesus because there could be death, there could be something very serious about your faith. Maybe it's not true faith. And I say this carefully because I know that even in church history there have been witnesses who have faltered and then they stayed living a little, but regretted it so greatly and asked forgiveness and died later. So yes, it's not easy to say, could I be a martyr? But if you know that you prefer this world than Christ, that indicates you're not wanting to follow Jesus. When Jesus said you must be willing to take up your cross and follow me, he was literally saying, are you ready to be a martyr? And if you're not, then you're not ready. You don't understand what it means to be a Christian. Are, are you settled that this is God's given method? You see what God is giving His church. It is nothing about money. It is nothing about methods in terms of strategies. It is the gospel. The proclamation of the gospel through messengers of the gospel. Trusting in the power of the Holy Spirit. Are you settled with that mythology that is God-given? Um, do, do you see the power in this method? Because it proved itself. It's not in the messenger. We know this. Peter is someone who is just recently a denier. And pretty soon we'll meet the first missionary of the church that becomes so used and he begins as a persecutor. We know the power does not reside in the messenger. Are, are you satisfied with the method that God has given? This is important because the church is going all over. In, in denominations, they're, they're scrambling and finding ways to find methods to bring people back to church. And they're spending money and they're using a lot of even technologies and techniques of the world. Well, we have them right here. It is the gospel message is the gospel messengers willing to trust the power of the Spirit and be ready to die? Are you satisfied with the power? Do you believe in the power of this message? And we, we will see it being unfolded as we go through the pages of the book of Acts. This is the only way God gets the glory. Paul reminded us, even as he is in the height of his success, he said, don't look at me. It's not my rhetoric. It's not my eloquence. I'm the chiefest of sinners. I'm a wretched man. See, the faithful ministers are always decreasing so that Christ would increase. 
And then he gets all the glory. Amen. Let us pray. Our gracious, glorious God, even as we go through this passage of thy word, Lord, this book, we pray that thou would instruct us, Lord, that we would be as Mary's at the feet of Christ, hanging at every word that Christ would teach us, Lord, what it means to be a Christian, what it means to... to show forth the testimony of Christ in this world. Lord, would Thou raise among us men and women who are so willing to give their very lives for Christ a desire and a willingness. And and at the same time, we plead with Thee, Lord, that Thou would protect us and wherever we would go to share Thy Word, even throughout our own land or beyond. Lord, that Thou would protect, that Thou would bless as we pray for every missionary, that Thou would spare lives, but Lord, that Thou would give us this boldness, this willing heart, even as Christ said, those those who are not willing to take up the cross are not ready to follow me. Lord, may we not be as those who put our hands to the plow and, and look back, but that we would be willing to serve Thee. O Lord, use thy church, bless our own congregation, every boy and girl among us, young men and women, every father and mother, all our grandparents. Lord, be with each one of them. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name and for thy glory. Amen. We'll be singing Psalter 2.